Hello everyone and welcome to week two. I think we had a great first week. I really enjoyed the discussion and looking at your papers. And what I want to do with these videos is kind of underscore some of the things that you talked about and cover maybe some points that you didn't talk about to ensure that you really get the best understanding of the material that we're looking at. But before we get to that, I have a couple of housekeeping matters that I want to talk about with you. First off, remember that the introductions to your final wikis are due on Wednesday. Now these introductions will kind of serve as your project proposal as well. So make sure that you submit those as Word files through Blackboard. Next, make sure you stay on top of the discussion board. I really enjoyed reading those, and as I've done this class in the past, I've debated whether I should sound off, you know, or add comments to the discussion board, or whether I should let you as students lead the, the discussion. And this summer term, I've decided I'm going to kind of stay out of those discussions. Um, you'll see all the comments that I left you. I've definitely read them, and I encourage you other directions to follow. But I don't want to butt into that, because I find that when I do, um, I tend to, that tends to take over, and that's all what anybody talks about is what I've said. Next, make sure you stay on top of the thought papers and the quizzes. Uh, the quizzes, uh, I'm finding I'm having a hard time getting them up first thing on Monday. Uh, so I'll give you until Wednesday at midnight always for those. So you still have time to complete the quiz for this week. Well, next, let's talk about the quiz. Um, there were three questions that I identified that a lot of you struggled with. The first one was the question about online newspapers. Why did they struggle initially? I think one of the things that tripped a lot of people up here was that I asked you which of these following reasons applied the least. So in other words, all four of these things were legitimate things that newspapers struggled with as they adapted to technology. Scoops be have become less and less important as online news sources have proliferated. In fact, news organizations are le learning to use social media as their first stop to find the information that they then vet and share with their audiences. Both of the next questions that you guys struggled with came from the Schulte reading. I know that one was kind of dense, probably a lot more philosophical than the other two, which were mostly history-based, but I thought that reading provided a good bookend to why the history was important and what we can hope to learn from history. The first question was, Schulte decried the idea of technological determinism in relation to the Internet. How does she define it and why is it such a bad thing? Technological determinism is a concept I wanted to underscore because I think we all tend to fall into that pattern of thinking that technology determines how we use it when it's exactly the opposite. And that's one of the reasons why I really like the Schulte reading. Uh, this will set the tone, I think, for us as journalists on what stories we're going to cover and how we're going to present them online. We need to present them in the ways that we expect um, and that we are planning to use them. And that's how all of these readings kind of came together, I think. There's one more question that you guys struggled with a little bit, and that's the one where Schulte asks about America Online setting itself up as a corponation. All right, what do those mean? Schulte actually talks about those as being dangerous because when corporations like America Online start setting the direction for where the internet goes, it becomes less a cultural artifact and more a technological artifact. And we lose some of the freedom um, and the power that comes from having such a platform. That's why the correct answer here was, borrowing from the neoliberalism ideal, corporations were seen as better able to provide opportunities for discourse than governments. And that's one of the kind of the the debates that we're falling into when we get into net neutrality. And that actually gives us a good transition, and I think a good example, as we start talking about how all these readings fit together. So let's think about net neutrality. You know, it's the idea that everyone gets the same access, that all information on the web is prioritized in the same way. But what does net neutrality mean in relation to the things that we talked about this week? So first off, you know, what does history tell us about why net neutrality is important? I think you can get from some of the readings that the history of the internet is a free and open web. The internet developed from the ground up rather than from government establishing what it's going to be. And because of that tradition, we use it a lot differently than we would if it's something that was just handed to us. The culture and the history of the web supports this idea that the audience sets the tone rather than the editors. Now contrast that to journalists who like to say, well, we own the information, we're in control, we're going to give it to you. That doesn't work as well anymore on the internet, and that's something that we need to learn not to do. So with those things in mind, I wanted to look at a couple of quotes from your papers that address some of the key concepts of the readings for last week. And to kind of start things off, I think one of you had a really good realization about 
why the history of the Internet is important. Amid all the noise, it can be difficult to see where we as a community of media consumers and producers are going. After learning more about the history of the Internet, I see that media companies have been grappling with these problems for decades. And though this offers little comfort to someone who will be looking for a job in the very near future, it does provide a road map. I like that comment a lot because that's one of the things I wanted you to get from these readings, that these problems aren't new. Um, in fact, Gilmore's reading this week underscores that as well, where he says, you know, journalism used to look a lot different, and now all of a sudden we went to this corporate model, but the powers of the Internet are pushing us back to this personal model. And I hope you got from this, the readings this week that the history of the Internet is kind of what pushes us that, and that the culture that founded the Internet pushes us toward this more personal, uh, more open, and more accessible role of journalism. Our stories, or our videos, or our content is about conversations, not just about here is the archive, here is the history of what happened. Uh, another one of your quotes that I think was really interesting um, talked about what we should know about the history of the Internet. I suppose this is simply a roundabout way of saying that it had never really occurred to me how silly it is that I know the origins of video gaming, the environmentalist movement, even cars, though I'm not particularly interested in them, but what I know about them comes from the Internet, and I know nothing about that. Hopefully, by knowing the Internet and the culture behind it, this will inform the kind of journalism that you do. The next quote applies these same lessons specifically to the news media themselves. I am generally flustered about the balance between what did develop and why news is still struggling. It seems as if many newspapers, even influential ones, were testing new ways of using the Internet to distribute the news. But on the other hand, so many companies went bankrupt or fell out of the running or whatever you want to call it. I think a lot of this happened because news organizations fail to understand the culture of the Internet and how that culture determined how we use things. So knowing the history and the culture of the web and how these inform what we do on there, does this give us an idea, um, as one of you said, a road map for where we're going with this? Um, one of you had a really insightful comment about that. What I took away most from all of these readings, and especially the Vanity Fair article, was the sense that hardly any web users have ever known exactly what the Internet would become in their lifetime, or even what its potential usefulness was. I believe we still don't know, and as networking technology continues to grow at an exponential rate, the Internet's tools, especially in terms of communication, have so much more to offer. The more we understand about how the Internet came to be and the culture that drove it, I think will help us maybe not predict the future, but be prepared for the future. Think of it in the simplest terms of, why do we expect things to be free on the Internet? And what happens when we as news organizations fight against that ideal? Take content that we're doing and make it so it's not free, or put it behind paywalls. Finally, one of you had a really great point about how this culture helps determine that future. The Internet is a reflection of its billions of distinct users and the cultures and identities they each add to the whole. The sheer amount of cultural information contained within the network boggles my mind, and the fact that the Internet can be molded to suit an individual's personal uses and needs makes it one of the most adaptive tools in the world. Again, I think that's an exciting thing for journalists. You don't have to work for the big media conglomerates anymore. You, know, you should be just as adept as the vloggers to adapt these tools to the things that you're trying to do. As journalists, we're asked to do more, to be on social media, to build our own personal brands. I hope that from these readings, you learned a little bit about how the history of the Internet propels you to do so, and maybe even given you some tips on how that works. The basic tip I would give is just to be open to the audience, to listen to them and give them opportunities to connect with you and to connect with others. All right, well, that's just about it for this week, but I wanted to give you a quick preview of the readings. Uh, the first reading comes from Clay Shirky. He's a professor at NYU right now. He's worked in the media for a number of years, mostly on the technical side, and his two books, Cognitive Surplus and Here Comes Everybody, have been touchstones in how we understand the audience and how we reach out to them. His key point in Cognitive Surplus and that he builds upon and Here Comes Everybody is that the audience as a whole knows a lot more than we do. And that's what the Cognitive Surplus is. 
And we're better journalists if we can tap into that and use the audience for that goal. The next reading comes from Dan Gilmore. He was a tech blogger for the San Jose Mercury News. He started a blog really early on, and he learned from interactions with audience on his blog. And one of his key points is that you know every citizen is a reporter. We don't have just passive people reading what we do anymore. We have people who want to be involved. Finally, Convergence Culture is written by Henry Jenkins, the director of the New Media Lab at MIT. Uh, he's now at University of Southern California. But he uses his understanding of these communities to help us learn more about the culture of the internet and where we need to go as we try to provide content to wide and diverse audiences. Thanks again for watching. Uh, if you have any comments uh, or questions about the class, please feel free to email me. Uh, my email address is here at the bottom. Thanks and have a great week.